Professor Barbara, can you hear me? I can indeed, Sir Brian. Uh, and you can see me? Yes, I can. Good. Uh, in a moment or two, um, Ms Fraser Button will start asking you some questions uh, after Mary has uh, asked you to take the affirmation. Um, but first you can tell me, um, you're uh, at, uh, at your home, are you? I am, Sir Brian. Uh, and uh, at home, there's what your your wife uh, and others. Yes, and and my dog. And your dog, right? Who, uh, is, who is being kept securely out of the way so that he he doesn't join in? I was just going to ask it. that. Uh, you're talking to a, a room here in all which uh, in which there is a select and small group uh, of people. We have no more because of the restrictions we're observing. Uh, in, because of the current virus. Um, beyond this room, however, there are something in the region of 100 or so people who will be listening to everything that you have to say today. Um, so that, that's right. the audience that you have, uh, the public that you're speaking to. Now, Mary, would you invite Professor Barbara, please, to take the oath? Please state your full name. John Anthony James Barbara. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you. Professor Barbara, can you see and hear me? I can indeed, very clearly. Good. Professor, uh, you hold a PhD in microbiology. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So it's right, isn't it? You're not a medical clinician, rather you're a scientist. No, I'm a consultant clinical scientist. And in 1974, you became the head of microbiology at the North London Blood Transfusion Service. Yes. That was about the same time as when Professor Contreras also joined the North London Service, isn't it? Yeah, I have it in my mind. We joined on the same day, but um, I can't be sure of that. The inquiries heard evidence, as you know, from Professor Contreras, uh, and uh, that she became director of the centre in 1984. When that happened, is it right that you and Dr Patricia Hewitt uh, shared responsibility for the scientific and clinical microbiology work at the centre? Yes. And would it be right that Dr Hewitt took on the clinical aspect of the work and you the scientific aspects? Yes, she, she was um, dealing with the medical side and I was dealing with um, the, the clinical science. Just to complete the overview of your career, you then became microbiology consultant at the National Blood Authority in 1994. Yes, and reported to Angela Robinson at that time, as well as to Marcella Contreras. And you remained in that role until 2001? Yes. And at that point, you became an emeritus consultant... Yes, I went back to London two days a week for just over five years. And you remained there till about 2005, is that right? Yes, about that, uh, 2006. I just want to talk with you to begin with about your role at the North London Centre. You had responsibility for everything to do with microbiology, is that right? Yes, um, 
uh, including the provision, the detection and provision of high theta immune globulins, like for um, HBIG, hepatitis B immunoglobulin, things like that. Can you tell us a little more of what a microbiologist work entails? I suppose the core was the screening of the thousand or so donations a day that we would receive for uh, an ever-increasing number of microbial agents and then the confirmation of any reactives, um, the dealing with the, uh, the donors who were found to be positive and because our honorary consultant was Dr. David Dane at the Middlesex, who had discovered uh, what was known as the Dane particle, the actual infectious particle of hepatitis B virus. With his advice, I was able to set up counseling for HBSAG positive donors. Um, and we also did any follow-ups of possible post-transfusion infections. We did bacteriological screening of plasma before it was returned to the plasma, uh, before the red cells were returned to plasmapheresis donors. Um, and we did a variety of projects associated with the development of microbial aspects. Um, I kept registers of um, infected donors. We followed up, I think I've already said, things like jaundice inquiries. Um, and eventually, I, I was a founder member of Serious Hazards of Transfusion. And so it was quite a, a wide-ranging um, set of uh, remit uh, also developed automation, computerization, because obviously when you're dealing with four or five thousand tests a day, the more you can streamline it, the more you can ensure an error-free pathway and proper quality control, then the better. Forgive me for sniffing. I, I, um, I, I'm afflicted with Qatar. I think it's a slight change in the weather. Please don't worry. I, I can see that something's happened with the picture. I just want to check that you can still see and hear us and that we've not lost you. Yes, perfectly. Good. Uh, we, we, we had a message that the bandwidth oh. was low. Uh, that's uh, Professor Barbara's bandwidth is low. Yes. So um, I hope that will be rectified. Indeed. Um, I fear we're at the end of the line in the country. Would it be fair then from that description of what your role entailed, would it be fair that you were then focused on the science involved in the testing of blood and in securing the best data uh, in the issues of, of testing that you were dealing with? Yes, that, that was mainly um, the thrust of things, but there were a whole variety of associated projects. Uh, I was, because of our help from, from Dr. Dane, I was able to set up panels of infected donors, which other centers didn't do. We were able to, for example, plasmapherese high theta HBSAG positive donors so that the plasma could be used um, for a project that was started by Professor Ari Zuckerman to develop a British plasma-derived hepatitis B vaccine, um, which didn't actually come to fruition. But there were those, a lot of those sort of things. But would it, would it be fair that your focus was on the science rather than the clinical side of the uh, North London Centre? Yes. And you weren't, in your role, charged with making decisions about the broader policies that were in play, 
in relation to which tests to introduce and when at the centre, that would have been for the director? Yes, with the input from the evidence, the data we collected, um, the kit assessments, um, but the decision would be from the director, yes. It's right, isn't it, that the North London Centre was the only regional transfusion centre to employ someone with a PhD, with a doctorate in microbiology, to lead their microbiology laboratories? Yes, that, that is correct. This was initiated by the previous director, Dr Tom Cleghorn, who very early on engaged uh, Dr. Dane as honorary consultant and um, I think in my statement I may have described Tom Clayhorn as visionary because he recognized that rather than being a nuisance that you had to get round the problem of transfusion transmitted infection if anything would grow bigger so he was very far-sighted and, uh, you know, along came the whole range of agents that I, I've listed in one of the slides from my lectures that I've appended. And um, I think um, Dr. Claycorn, with Dr. Dane's advice, decided to have a bespoke microbiologist or virologist to head the department. That visionary uh, view of Dr. Cleghorn must have been in the early 70s because your appointment was in, appointment was in 1974. Did he ever yes. talk to you about what it was that he, and why it was, he, he felt this was something that was coming down the road? Um, yes. In various conversations, the details of which, of course, I really don't remember... Um, I became aware that he was certainly aware that the microbial aspect of transfusion was not going to be limited to bacterial screening of blood before it was returned to plasma donors. The syphilis testing that had been in place for donkey's years and in the early 70s, the newly set up hepatitis B uh, surface antigen testing. Um, I think he was aware that blood was an ideal portal of entry for blood-borne infections to be transmitted to a patient with blood being infused directly into their bloodstream. I've also been asked to ask you whether it would be fair that because you were the only um, Micro, head of microbiology with the doctorate, that made you something of an anomaly within the blood service? Uh, in that respect, I guess I was anomalous, yes. And, and I didn't think of it that way. And therefore, whether you were effectively working alone with somewhat limited peer-to-peer -peer interaction and engagement? Uh, no, the uh, people who headed um, the other blood centre, um, what used to be called AU testing labs, Australia Antigen, were senior technical staff, um, initially known as technicians, but then more appropriately called medical laboratory scientific officers. And I was in close contact and had various projects and derived a lot of good information and ideas from these colleagues in all the other 13 or so centres around the country. Are you aware of any discussions with other regional transfusion centres about them also employing uh, postdoctoral microbiologists? No. Not, at, not in the early stages at all. In terms of the physical location of the North London Centre, it, it was physically very close to the PHLS, wasn't it? 
across the fence, yes. And also the CDSC. Yes. How much interaction was there, firstly, between you and the PHL? Um, a lot, and it grew considerably as the list of potential microbial risks of transfusion also grew. So um, I would be across the fence a lot, and they would be across the fence to us. Um, the the public health lab, the communicable disease surveillance centre, a lot of interaction. That was one of the benefits of being where we were. And those interactions, were they informal discussions about things you were looking at or were they more formal meetings? Um, it was a mixture. Uh, there were lots of informal um, kicking ideas around. There were also formal committees, which I know you've got listed and I've forgotten most of the ones I was on or chaired. Um, and there were joint projects that we would set up. Um, for example, the kit evaluation group um, involved Dr. John Parry, uh, now Professor John Parry, in doing the Sera conversion panel assessments that I've described in my statement. Before we get there, I just want to discuss with you a little bit more about um, the, some of the, the things that were set up in the North London Centre. At, at some point in the centre, you set up an archive of serum samples. Do you recall yes. when that archive was established? Not exactly. Um, it, it was reasonably early on and it was facilitated by automation, automated samplers and the use of a microplate, uh, 12 by 8, a 96 well microplate. Again, there is a slide in, in, in my package of stuff. Um, which meant that we could store large amounts of samples securely, but in a small space and with um, data retrieval because they were barcode labelled. Uh, so just... it, it was quite early on and it did serve as a model, I know, for other centres. The Scots had, had started at around the same time. And just so that those who are listening uh, understand what a microplate is, it, it's a, a plate with wells in where a small sample of serum can be put into each well and labelled and then frozen down. Yes, and the, the archive microplate, I spotted in the manufacturer's catalogues what was called a deep well microplate that took one millilitre, one ml. And of course that that was a godsend, and you could cap it as well. Did the North London Centre seek to encourage other centres to set up a similar archive of samples? Um, I don't think there was formal encouragement. There was a lot of interaction and contact between the microbiologists at the centres and we would set up seminars and we would discuss things like serum archives. So I think that ideas did catch on and it was a two-way thing. We took on ideas, other centres took on ideas. Moving on then to post-transfusion hepatitis and the screening test for hepatitis B. In the late 1970s, if your lab identified a donation as testing positive in a screening test for hepatitis B, can you talk us through the process that was then followed? Um, Just broadly. Okay, oh, broadly. Okay. Do stop me if I get carried away by my pet subjects. Um, you would do a test, 
for HPSAG, and if it was initially reactive, we never called them positive until they were confirmed. If it was initially reactive, we would repeat on that sample in duplicate. And if one or both of those were also reactive, we would get a snippet of bleed line from that pack and test the bleed line as well to make sure that we got the right sample for the right pack. Then those samples at that time, before we had our own reference lab set up, they would go to um, the Middlesex Hospital for confirmatory testing. There would be um, neutralization tests done that would confirm that by ablating the reaction with specific anti-HBS, you could say that that reaction was definitely HBSAG. You would do anti-HBC testing and you would check whether it was of the IgG or IgM antibody class. And if it was IgM, you would know that it was a recent or an acute infection. And at some point in that process, would the donation be held <coughs> so that it didn't leave the centre? As soon as there was uh, a repeat reactive <coughs> result, which came within the same day, that donation would be held. No donation would be released until my lab would have cleared them. And any initial reactive would not have been cleared. A repeat reactive would have been held and my staff would collect the uh, donation from the blood bank and uh, store it securely in a fridge. Thinking back to the archive sample, once that archive was available, if a donation tested uh, was reactive, repeatedly reactive, would you then go back to the stored samples to check them for the same donor? No. Why not? No, we, we, we would save the stored sample for any future uh, use. If there was a discrepancy between the test sample and the snippet from the bag, then we would go back to the archive sample. Uh, sorry, Professor Barbara, that was my question that wasn't clear enough. Um, if you have a donor who's a repeat donor and the current oh, donation uh, sorry, has tested... Oh, sorry, not a repeat reactive. Uh, it, you've, you've got a current donor who's tested positive. Would you go back to their historic prior donations in the archive? Apologies, my question was... Forgive me. I, miss, I thought you were meaning a repeatably reactive sample. I'm sorry. Um, yes, absolutely. We would go back to the archive sample and we'd, first of all, retest in my lab in case we'd made an error... Um, and I'm happy to say another topic, but we could show that we made very few testing errors. If um, we couldn't find any HBSAG, we would um, send the archive sample to the Middlesex, <clears throat> and they would, in the early days, have access to radioaminoassay, which subsequently we, we were able to develop for our own use, they would have that more sensitive test, they would check it for anti-core and anti-core IgM. And then if there was any uh, hint that it was infectious, we would inform, I would inform the hospital and we would, I or, or Dr. Hewitt, and we would request samples from the recipient of that donation preferably samples um, rather than them testing it because um, our reference laboratory um, had a, a good range of specialist tests to get to the bottom of, of the problem. And thinking about the reverse situation, um, Professor Barbara,
The centre also operated the J system that the inquiry has heard about, uh, didn't it, in relation to post-transfusion hepatitis reports? Well, when you say J, uh, there was JH, jaundice history, and JE, jaundice inquiry. So, yes, we operated a JE system. So, if a clinician reported that a recipient of a transfusion had post-transfusion hepatitis, you would then make inquiries into what had happened? Yes, we would ask the clinician if they wouldn't mind sending us a sample. We would also ask if they got a pre-donation or pre-transfusion sample because sometimes um, we would be following up a potential case only to find that the recipient had a pre-existing uh, HPV infection. And then when we got those samples, we would do the battery of tests that I've described to check whether they were infected. And because the serology for Hep B was so extensive, had been well worked out early on, we'd be able to say what stage of the infection that recipient was, was in. And when you say the battery of tests, that would include a hepatitis B core antibody test? Yes, IgG, IgM and E antigen and anti-HBE. Uh, we, they'd also do ALT and AST. Could we turn then to WITN 69890111, please? Sorry, will this come up on my screen? It should come up on your screen, Professor Barbara. Just give it a moment and please say if it doesn't. OK. OK. Um, forgive me, I'll take my glasses off so I can read it more easily. Of course. Oh, yes. This is a... Uh, ah, that's better. This is a document, uh, 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 um, uh, an article that you wrote with Moya Briggs. It's dated yes. at the top September 1982, headed post-transfusion hepatitis in North London in 1981, a review. And we can see in yes. the first paragraph... At the hepatitis workshop held in Scotland last year, we presented a review of post-transfusion hepatitis in North London during the previous 10 years. The present report provides details of our 1981 uh, PTH, post-transfusion hepatitis, inquiries. And then in the next yes. paragraph, we can see that there were uh, 16 PTH reports received in 1981. Two, yeah, two of the 16. Yes, two of the 16. And then if we turn on to page six of the document and we have the heading conclusion. Yes. Could we just zoom into the, into the conclusion part, please? PTHD to hepatitis. We'll just zoom into the conclusion so it's a bit easier to see. Yep. Uh, it, it reads this, our inquiries into PTH during 1981 illustrate the diversity and complexity of this work. Uh, and you were referring there, weren't you, to the uh, number of tests that were involved and the difficulties in tracing what the root cause of the PTH was, weren't you? Yeah, and the differentiation of which agent may have been responsible, if at all. And then we see this at the bottom of the page. We're trying to encourage the hospitals we supply to report all PTH in the hope we can get more information about non-A, non-B as a cause of PTH in the UK. Is it yes. fair then, Professor Barbara, that in 1981 you recognised that not all cases of post-transfusion hepatitis were being reported to you? Yes. Um, if I could amplify slightly, I think even earlier we were aware of two things, that not all post-transfusion hepatitis was due to hepatitis B, and also that not all cases 
were necessarily being reported. And so with Marcella, with uh, Professor Contreras and Dr. Hewitt and other colleagues, we did set about quite um, regularly updating, doing seminars for our, our hospitals to, imp to impress on them the value of telling us about any possible cases, um, in part um, so that we could prevent any infectious donor from infecting other recipients. Um, and if I could also add that you asked about my remit earlier, um, this aspect of education and th this aspect of um, R&D, for example, to analyze the cases of post-transfusion hepatitis B reports, that was an important part of what I did. And, and of course, this was helped by being a, a bespoke virologist or microbiologist. We saw there a moment ago a reference to a study that looked at the um, a longer period of, of post-transfusion hepatitis reports. I just want to go to that document, CBLA 301301, please. Oh, if yes. we zoom into the top of it so that it's a little bit easier to read on the screen, we can see that it's a short communication in the Medical Laboratory Sciences Journal 1981 uh, we, by you and uh, Moya Briggs uh, again. And then if we go down to the body of the text on this page, please. Uh, we can see that you're presenting preliminary results of your approach to the examination of the extent of post-transfusion hepatitis of the non anon B type in the region served by the North London Blood Transfusion Centre. And then if we go further down in this paragraph, we can see... Oh, it, it reads, the numbers of cases of post-transfusion hepatitis reported to us during the last 10 years are shown in figure one. So... Uh I, I'm afraid I don't have that. It's okay. We're going to just turn the page where we see figure one, which is at the top of the oh, page, yes. which is rather difficult to read, Professor Barbara. So if we carry on to page three, we have a table, which is much more helpful, I think. Okay. And if we can look at that table, we can see the totals across 1976, 1977, 78, 79 and 80, the totals of the post-transfusion hepatitis reported cases. Yes. Yes. It's right, isn't it, Professor Barbara, that this study depended on the post-transfusion hepatitis being reported to you. Yes, absolutely. Um, we then go down to the next paragraph, please, below table two. And may I add mm. that that, of course, was why we encouraged hospitals to report anything that they were suspicious about so that we get a clearer picture of what the situation actually was. And we can see in, in the paragraph highlighted, most of our cases of post-transfusion hepatitis are based on reports of clinical jaundice. Of 15 cases reported during 1977 to 1980, this was the presenting factor in 13. In two of the cases where the patient was not jaundiced, one had chronic hepatitis and subsequently became hepatitis B surface antigen positive while the other recipient felt unwell and had re raised bilirubin and liver enzyme levels. In two cases where blood from donors incubating hepatitis B was transfused, both recipients became um, hepatitis uh, B E antigen positive in apparent carriers 
of the surface antigen, though with raised liver enzymes. Just pausing there, it, it's right that as well, isn't it, that as well as being entirely dependent on post-transfusion hepatitis being reported to you, those reports would only be made if someone had clinical jaundice or something else to cause the clinicians to suspect that there was an issue? Yes. And then if we go to the final paragraph of this paper... Thank you. We can see uh, that the conclusion uh, in the last paragraph is the clinical importance of chronic aspects of non-A, non-B hepatitis is not yet clear, and much chronic non-A, non-B hepatitis resolves itself within two years. Probably post-transfusion hepatitis B is more important than the non-A, non-B variety, since not only does it appear to be the more severe infection, but if transmitted to a patient in hospital, it may be the source of more obvious infections among the staff. Even with sensitive screening methods currently available for testing donor blood, the hospital reports of post-transfusion hepatitis are still important for the prevention of further cases caused by the same donor. Yes. Your conclusion there that... Um, post-transfusion hepatitis B is more important than the non-A, non-B variety. Was that based on the number of post-transfusion hepatitis cases that were being reported to you where it wasn't hepatitis B? Um, sorry, I, I couldn't quite catch the last part of your question. Let me, let me rephrase it. Your conclusion here is that post-transfusion hepatitis B it is probably more important than non-A, non-B uh, hepatitis. Given that you were reliant on reports of post-transfusion hepatitis and given that the majority of those post-transfusion hepatitis reports indicated hepatitis B positivity, was that part of the reason why you concluded that hepatitis B was more important than non-A, non-B? Yes, I, I understand what you're saying now. Um, yes, I suppose the clinicians um, were more, um, uh, would, would more readily report a possible post-transfusion hepatitis if they, their laboratory had found hepatitis B surface antigen. So there might have been a bias in terms of the number of cases of um, post-transfusion B reported. I think also um, the non-A, non-B as we knew it then would often generally be milder and might not have been picked up unless they were doing liver function tests. Um, and uh, certainly there was a, quite a general feeling um, in, in, uh, in blood service circles that uh, hepatitis B was more severe um, could kill you, you could get fulminant hepatitis because of a very vigorous antibody response that <laughs> paradoxically would prove fatal in a small number of cases. Um, so I think those, those were the factors that made us feel that B was more severe than non-A, non-B. And it's right, isn't it, that asymptomatic non-A, non-B, at least initially asymptomatic non-A, non-B cases, would be missed entirely, or potentially missed entirely, by this study? Yes. Um, the American studies would have uh, funded prospective work, um, some brilliant work by... by um, Harvey, Dr. Harvey Alter, 
who would follow up recipients with en liver enzyme studies. So they would see the evidence for non-A, non-B. You've said in your statement that at that time you didn't consider non-A, non-B as something that was particularly uh, serious in terms of the clinical condition. Is that right? Not, not as serious as hepatitis B. Yes, I, uh, I felt that. Do you have any sense of the time frames when your view about the seriousness of non-A, non-B um, shifted? Um, I, I can't pinpoint that. Forgive me, I, my memory is, is not that clear. What I would say is that as the first serological tests were became available from Chiron and Ortho, although their specificity uh, and predictive value in a low incidence and prevalence population was poor, in a patient population, it had more predictive value, and one was able to read reports of hepatitis C being detected in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma or chronic liver disease. And so it was latterly that the awareness of the significance of what we knew as non-A, non-B became clearer. Sorry, does that make sense? Thank you, Professor Preston. Can I take you to a paper uh, that the inquiries looked at a number of times? PRSE 303622, just to see if this assists. It's a paper that was published in The Lancet on the 16th of September 1978 by Professor Preston, headed Percutaneous Liver Biopsy and Chronic Liver Disease in Haemophiliacs, where it's reported that there had been systematic screening of 47 haemophiliacs in Sheffield and um, liver biopsies had been uh, carried out. And we see in the middle of the paragraph that a wide spectrum of chronic liver disease was demonstrated, including chronic aggressive hepatitis and cirrhosis. Was that a paper that had crossed your desk that you were aware of in the late, in the late 70s? Um, it may well have. I have to be honest, it, I didn't recall it until I saw it in um, the documents that you uh, kindly sent to me. So you're not sure if at the time that was something you were familiar with, Professor Preston's work? I'm very, it was very likely I was, but um, there were an enormous number of publications that um, I would have been involved with and in reading. Um, so uh, I was certainly aware of um, Professor Preston and the work he was doing. And I have a, I have a feeling of it a sort of recollection that there was a general, I had a general awareness, of, but I can't say definitively that I read that paper. I probably did. I'm asked to ask you with whether, whether with the benefit of hindsight, do you think that the North London Centre or, or you were too slow to recognise the seriousness of non-A, non-B hepatitis? Um... I think that once a specific test, and I say specific in the general term, was able to identify the virus in patients significantly affected, I think we were pretty quick to be aware then. I think beforehand, 
Um, yes, there may have been uh, a feeling that it was less important than hepatitis B. And I have to be honest, in terms of severity, chronic condition, carrier state, sexual transmission, transmission from mother to child, I still feel that hepatitis B is a more aggressive virus. Can we then look at some of the um, testing that uh, the centre was doing in relation to post-transfusion hepatitis? If we look at NHBT 5030 uh, underscore 007. It's a short communication in Vox Sanguinis uh, in 1983 yes. that you wrote with Professor Contreras and, and Dr. Moya Briggs. Um, headed a donor... But Moya didn't, have a, oh, Moya didn't have a doctorate. A apologies. So she would have deserved one. Uh, it's headed a donor implicated in two cases of post-transfusion non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, I'm just going to read yes. some of it and then I'll pause and ask you some questions about it. In the absence yes. of specific tests for non-A, non-B hepatitis viruses, evidence for their involvement in post-transfusion hepatitis can only be circumstantial. Uh, the report then discusses a, a particular a donation. A, a, a UK-born male had donated one of only two units given as whole blood to a patient who became jaundiced six weeks after transfusion, Serum taken from this patient at the time of jaundice was negative by RIA for hepatitis B surface antigen, uh, hepatitis B core antibody, and hepatitis A, but weakly positive for hepatitis B surface antibody. After notification of this case of post-transfusion hepatitis, the two donors involved were resampled. Serum from the other donor was negative by RAA uh, for hepatitis B surface uh, antigen, but positive for hepatitis B core antibody, IgM, class negative, and uh, hepatitis B surface antibody. This donor also had mildly elevated liver enzyme levels, uh, and you give the figures for the ALT yes. and the AST. Although the implication of the second donor was only presumptive, he was asked to refrain from blood donation until further notice. Uh, you then explain that because of an error where the donor was told he was safe to donate again, he, he then donated seven months later, and the recipient of that donation was identified as having post-transfusion uh, hepatitis. Then if we go over the page... Uh, you set out the testing of that subsequent donation uh, and you conclude at the bottom of the page, nevertheless, the situation at... Sorry, are we at the right place? Yes, nevertheless, the situation yes. described uh, a donor who's both uh, hepatitis B surface antibody and anti hepatitis B core antibody positive and is suspected of a possible link with post-transfusion hepatitis justifies, in our opinion, the permanent exclusion of this donor from donating blood. Yes. Just uh, you, you, you add uh, at the end of that... I'm just going to come to that. The, uh, that, that last sentence. You're going to deal with the last sentence. I will, absolutely. Well. I just want, before we get there, I want to deal with one other point, if I may, sir. Um, just before we look at the last sentence, I just want to be clear, Professor Barbara, that when you were dealing with post-transfusion hepatitis situations like this... You were testing samples for hepatitis B core antibody, hepatitis B surface antigen, ALT and AST. Is that right? Yes. And would it be that fair... Was be sorry. No, go for it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, because there was, um, if you like, a higher... Um, le uh, level of potential. Sorry, I'm I'm tongue-tied for the moment. 
because it has been a report of post-transfusion hepatitis, there was, if you like, a smoking gun that made it more indicated to do these um, supplementary tests, which is why we would have done those. It, there wouldn't have been tests that we would have done on any donor. Uh, it was just because this donor had been one of those uh, and potentially implicated in a case of post-transfusion non A, non B in a recipient. Forgive me for interrupting. No, I think there's a slight delay on the system, which is making it slightly difficult. So um, please don't apologise for interrupting uh, at all. Essentially, what we see here is, isn't it, that there's, you're using those tests as a surrogate for non-A, non-B hepatitis testing. Yes. Then if we come to the last sentence of the article... Uh, you note that this procedure is reminiscent of measures taken for the prevention of post-transfusion hepatitis B before hepatitis B surface antigen tests became uh, available. Yes. Um, I, of course, wasn't in service then, but I was aware from the literature and from uh, the discussions with um, Dr. Dane and, and, and Moya Briggs, that just this kind of thing, an indirect surrogate approach, would have been the only thing they had um, when investigating post-transfusion Hep B, or likely Hep B. But it's right, isn't it, that these tests weren't used by the centre across the board to screen routinely on a surrogate basis. That's right, because, if you like, the, the report of possible transmission or uh, infection of a recipient f enabled you to focus on a very small number of donors that would benefit from these indirect, um, non-specific and surrogate tests. I want to pick up that point a little bit later because it comes later in the chronology again. Um, and we will, we will address it again in relation to uh, hepatitis C a little bit later today. Can I move now to your understanding of HIV? And you've said in your statement that your understanding of HIV shifted over time, but that at first you didn't link it to blood transfusion. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Uh, do you want me to expand on this slightly? Yes, please do. Um, when... Uh, an immune deficiency syndrome was f initially described with reports in MMWR, morbidity, mortality, weekly reports from the US CDC. Um, it was very difficult to know, to make sense of that. It appeared to be uh, eventually appeared to be due to an infectious agent. Certainly, it was indirectly picked up by CDC because of the increased incidence of pneumocystis carinii um, and the increased um, dispensing of uh, pentamidine which was a, a, a drug used to treat pneumocystis. And initially, people wondered whether it could be some sort of agent like swine fever that had, that had gone rogue, or whether it was due to the use of recreational drugs 
so-called poppers, or even whether it was due to a suppression of the immune system in the passive partner in a male homosexual relationship being exposed in delicate mucosal areas to large amounts of the active partner's semen. Your view shifted somewhat, didn't it, Professor Barbara, when you received a call from Dr Roger Dodds? Yes. He was the head yes, of the, the American... Yes, He was the head of American Red Cross Transfusion Infection Laboratories. Yeah, he, he was sort of my oppo, my opposite number over there. And, and I knew Roger very well. He was an expat Brit, uh, a virologist, and we had worked together, and um, he was somebody that I knew and could, could talk to freely. And he phoned me one day to say that um, they heard that two haemophilia patients had developed AIDS, or I think it was called GRIDS at the time, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Syndrome, and I immediately said, well, I suppose they're homosexual men. And he said, no, uh, they don't think so, married with kids. And the chill realization that this was a virus and as such would have been transmissible by blood and even by fractionated products because the process of fractionation to make factor eight would inactivate parasites and bacteria, but didn't inactivate the acellular virus particles, uh, any acellular virus particles. So it was, I think, I don't know, about 1983, that this was a phone call that absolutely stuck in my mind and still does. I don't remember the date. I'm not good on dates, I suppose. Can I, can I try and assist you with the date, um, Professor Barbara? The inquiries heard evidence of that CDC report being on the 16th of July, 1982. To the best of your recollection, do you think that Dr Roger Dodds phoned you fairly swiftly after that CDC report? That seems very likely. And so it's more likely to have been in around July 1982 than the 1983 that you, you'd taken a guess at. Uh, yeah, it, looking at it with the report uh, data, yes. And so at that point, uh, I think your evidence is that you understood uh, HTLV3, AIDS, the, the name that it was given at the time, um, to be transmitted by blood, to the best of your understanding? To be potentially transmitted by blood, yes. It seemed a real possibility, a frightening possibility, but a real one. Moving forwards in time, uh, you were involved in the drafting of the first AIDS leaflet together with Dr Tom Davies, is that right? Dr Davies, yes. Could we have NHBT 00020668, please? We have a, a letter from Dr Wagstaff uh, from July 1983 enclosing a copy of the final form of the leaflet. If we then go over the page, we have a copy of the leaflet. Is this the version of the leaflet that you were involved in? C as far as you recall. Could I have it a bit bigger, please? Of course. Yes, I, I believe I was involved in this, and more specifically in the little fold-over fold leaflet, the smaller-sized one, about, I don't know, 
uh, eight or nine inches by four inches that continually um, evolved. But okay. yes, I would have had involvement in this. If we look under the heading, who is at risk from AIDS? We see three groups of people who are said to appear to be particularly susceptible. One, homosexual men who have many different partners. Two, drug addicts, male and female, using injections. Three, sexual contact of people suffering from AIDS. Firstly, in relation to the, yeah. the first category, homosexual men who have many different partners, was that something that you were involved in drafting that wording? Um, yes, uh, I would have been involved. That wording wouldn't have been down to me. There was a reluctance amongst um, RTD, uh, Transfusion Centre directors, to be prying, if you like, into donors' sexual uh, habits. And as an aside, I must say that um, since the majority of, of, of transfusion directors had a, a hematological background, um, they didn't, as it were, think like a microbiologist or a virologist where uh, sex and drugs were um, something that I would have always been aware of as potential um, routes of transmission of agents and, um, you know, the overlap of sex and drugs and blood donation, I was aware of. So there was a reluctance to pry too deeply. And also, it, it made sense at the time to recognize that on a statistical basis, the more partners you have, the more likely you are to encounter a partner who is infected with HIV. But it's right, isn't it, that it, this might suggest to a man in a stable partnership with another man that they were still eligible to donate? Yes. With the yes. benefit I, of... It... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I, I would... I would certainly have had that feeling myself, yeah. And whether at the time or with the benefit of hindsight, do you think it would have been better for this to have said men who have had sex with men? Yes, I do. If we then look at the second group, drug addicts, male and female using injections, might this also suggest that those who have perhaps injected drugs once or twice would similarly not be caught by this definition? Um, yes, I, I, I think, again, with hindsight, you know, intravenous drug users, either male or female, would have been the coverall. But at that time, um, one was able to use just the word drug addict, male and female. And I agree. The phrase using injections implies now or currently or recently. So, uh, again, with hindsight, I would have preferred something stronger. But as I said, I, I would have been a part input into uh, this document, which, was, uh, which would have had a lot of input from various people, um, often more senior than myself. And then if we go down to the heading, can AIDS be transmitted by... Well, trans just, just before you, you do that, um, we, we picked up uh, yesterday when uh, Dr. Wagstaff was giving evidence that the, the first of those categories, homosexual man, men who, who have many different partners, is just as you uh, have described in respect to the word using. It, it's talking about now as opposed to the past. It's in present tense. So also, arguably, uh, 
uh, is sexual contacts of people suffering from AIDS. The, from your perspective, would the risk uh, actually be not just those who are currently engaged in sex with a, a many different partners, men being a, a, a homosexual, uh, those who are currently using injections, and those who are currently a sexual contact of someone who has AIDS, but people who have been, to their knowledge, in the past? Uh, absolutely, Sir Brian. I think um, I would have preferred to have that element strengthened. Of course, going back to a time when um, we now know that HIV was circulating um, from the early 80s in smaller numbers, probably even earlier. But for me, it wasn't a current or a recent because a past event might have caused the damage of infection. So, yes, I totally agree with you. Well, it, it was a question, really, rather than a, an observation, but it is, uh, I suppose, also an observation. Thank you. Then if we can go down to the heading, can AIDS be transmitted by transfusion of blood and blood products? And the answer there is given almost certainly yes. Uh, the inquiries heard evidence from Dr. Walford uh, about the original draft of the leaflet that she and Dr. Gunson prepared, I think, just before you uh, worked on it. And they'd answered that question simply as, yes, it can. Do you recall why that wording was changed from, yes, it can, to almost certainly yes? Um, I have to be honest, no, I, I can't recall that at this stage. Or even whether I was involved in changing that particular aspect. I'm sorry. Again, with the benefit of hindsight, or perhaps from your understanding at the time, it would have been more accurate, wouldn't it, if it had simply said, yes, it can? Yes. I mean, you might have couched it as there are reports of transmission by transfusion. Thank you. Sir, I'm about to move on to a, another topic, and I note the time. I wonder if now is a good time to take a break. Uh, yes, well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll do that and uh, uh, and come come back at, at twenty to, um, to twelve. Uh, can I I just say, Professor, what I say to all witnesses at this stage, which is that um, you're giving evidence. What you may not do is talk about the evidence you have given or anything which you think you may yet be asked about in evidence with anyone, whoever it is. You can talk about anything else you like. But I hope you have a, 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 a satisfying break. Um, and uh, we'll be back at 20 to 12, if you please. Yes, I understand that. Thank you very much.